we might debate how much was he really responsible for the whole disaster, but we should be rather certain that he was a dedicated party member. Of course, that was expected of him. Don't think he objected the party in any way. He did exactly what every other Soviet acolyte in his position would do. He lied. Hello guys. Today we directly continue the last week's episode, which was focused at Chernobyl nuclear power plant creator and director, Viktor Brukhanov. As many other people involved in the Chernobyl disaster, he's a complicated man, and looking at him, we must use a wide scale of grey, not black and white. That's why we previously sketched his story, but connecting it to the power plant's history itself, rather than making it his own. And that's why we created the previous episode and this one, to share the depths of his life and experiences, because the place he was born in, the people he met, the things he saw, and the system he was a part of, made and shaped him. We have to understand, as well as we can only manage to, why he behaved the way he did. So, let's get back to Brukhanov's story. Chernobyl Victims The Management Viktor Petrovich Brukhanov Part 2 In the far Ukrainian wilderness, up north of Kiev, there was a calm and quiet river called Pripyat. Soviet specialists found the surrounding areas perfect for a new, colossal project a power plant fueled by nuclear energy made inside six massive RBMK reactors. At first, the dream stayed only that, but soon the ideas became plans and the plans became reality. Every day growing number of workers, which once was a handful of men living inside wooden huts in the center of a thick forest, started to need more than just a place to lie and eat after a long and tiresome day. The plants consisted of not only a power plant itself, but also a huge infrastructure. After all, the manpower needed to operate the nuclear reactors and everything related to them was enormous, counted in hundreds of people. Those people had families, and their own needs. Covering even the basic ones meant more people running the shops, construction sites, electrical grids, transportation, schools, etc. The number of people grew exponentially, and their needs as well. Even at the beginning the Soviets planned to create out of nothing yet another place, a nuclear city, Atomgrad, bearing the name of the river, Pripyat. Viktor Brukhanov saw it from the very beginning to the time when another unit in his power plant became operational. Yet again I want to remind you the differences between the reactor being operational and being commissioned. These were two completely separate events in the life of every RBMK in those times. The Soviets didn't build Chernobyl nuclear power plant because they were vain. They built it because it was a symbol a symbol of USSR power and might. But the truth was simpler, they needed electricity more than ever, and if we were to believe some reports, to produce compounds for nuclear weapons. That's why there were many different sides in every aspect of life and work in the Soviet Union. The official side, and the practical one. They often mixed together or were completely distant from each other. But regarding the RBMK reactors in Chernobyl, they were first mounted, then started to produce electricity as quickly as it was possible. Officially, this moment for every RBMK reactor was called as the connection to the power grid. Because of that, the tests, including the most infamous one, were done after the launch, not before, as we might suspect they should. This wasn't the most important cause of the disaster, Yet, one another pebble, that, along with others, 
started an avalanche. Victor was sitting in his comfortable chair in his quite flashy office when the report came in. The fourth RBMK-1000 reactor was just connected to the grid. It was almost six years after it happened with the first one. 1977. Two years behind the schedule. What might think in our terms? Brukanov received the plan, the schedule, and the overall directions how he should fulfill them. So maybe you anticipate that for many years he was in a constant anxiety because the Soviet reality wouldn't let him complete his orders in time. On one hand, that might be true. He was quite nervous and even tried to resign, but was denied even this. On the other hand, he wasn't a freshman out of college. He knew how the system worked and that delays are as certain as death and taxes. Strange to us, maybe, but it was an everyday reality for every manager or director in the USSR, especially in the 1970s and 80s, when the economy began to crumble beneath bad management and spending too much money on things that were not paying back. Victor was a seasoned manager at that time already. Maybe Chernobyl was his first independent task, but there was only a handful of men that have worked on such a huge project. So I might say, there actually wasn't anyone significantly better than him. And he was a true believer. He was really convinced that by doing this task he will become one of the leaders of the true Soviet Union spirit and a hero of nuclear accomplishment. The power plant was supposed to be the biggest and most modern in the world. Brukhanov pictured himself as a father of its success and of what will come with it. Yet, he was there also when the bad things happened. He was supervising the response teams which reacted to one of the more severe accidents in Chernobyl's history, in September 1982. One of the fuel rods ruptured and the contaminated steam was released into the atmosphere. The spread was not as big as in 1986, of course, yet the ionized particles reached as far as 15 kilometers from the reactor. As you might have guessed, the Soviet leaders chose not to inform anyone about the incident, people of Pripyat included. And the people were in direct contact with the radioactive cloud. Because that was the decision, not only the people didn't receive any medicine or information, but also that the contamination was limited to the nuclear facility only. Any other would raise questions and questions could bring the reveal of vulnerable information. For decades, lives were just another statistic for the Soviet leaders. When the disaster happened, it would be safe to say that the management of the power plant was not completely strange to those kind of accidents. The real difference was the scale of the one in 1986. Every other was similar during the first hours, at least from the formal side, of course. Brukhanov was called during the night by the head of the chemical division. From the official records we might read that he was not informed about the test Dyatlov and his subordinates were performing just before the accident. That's another strange thing. Director didn't know about such an important procedure being taken out in one of the reactors. Well, Viktor had more to think about, that's why Dyatlov was talking with Fomin, who was the chief engineer of the power plant. When we think about Brukhanov's involvement in the disaster, we rather think of him as a silent character, who was responsible for the management side, but didn't directly touch the events. If we were to believe some of the reports, it was not true. After he was informed about the situation, Victor immediately traveled to the power plant. When he was passing by the fourth reactor unit, he must have clearly seen that at least some upper structure of the reactor was destroyed. After that, he ordered the meeting in the bunker under the administration building. He also sent a ciphered message to the Ministry of Energy and reported the situation to his superiors in Moscow, as well as to the local officials. We might debate how much was he really responsible for the whole disaster, but we should be rather certain that he was a dedicated party member and did his part to cover the incident during the first moments. Of course, 
That was expected of him. Don't think he objected the party in any way. He didn't. He did exactly what every other Soviet acolyte in his position would do. He lied. When I was writing this scenario, I hoped I would finish Brukhanov's story today. Yet, now I clearly understand, it's already a long video and I didn't even get close to the ending. So next week you will have the final episode. Well, <laughs> I hope at least. I encountered some interesting sources, so I'll have any new insights into Victor's fate after Chernobyl disaster and the trial. I hope you will like it. If you have any questions, feel free to ask them in the comments. I'm also sorry I didn't manage to answer all those from previous weeks, but I promise I will fix it during next few days. That's it for today, guys. Take care, stay safe, and see you next week.